Reactive training systems. It's just an interesting phenomenon with uh, people doing that just constantly. Like, oh, like I'm going to put on um, Dreams and Nightmares from Meek Mill and just play the crap out of that every time I go for a PR song. And all of a sudden, they're like, oh, it just didn't do it for me. And I'm like, well, we listened to it a thousand times in the right. last year. I, I think it's run its course. Like all things, one would expect that stimulus to stop working, you know? Yeah. It's no different than, you know, taking caffeine. At first, a uh, half cup of coffee would have you wired and... Next thing you know, you're three mugs deep. Don't you be yeah, put that back down. <laughs> exactly. I, I'm I'm no different. Yeah. Unfortunately, uh, unless we deliberately try to offload that, uh, so I'm looking for that element. Like in this case, like going back to caffeine. It's like unless we deliberately wean off caffeine and try to get ourselves resensitized to it. You know, you're going to be at this state where it's going to require. Yeah, caffeine's an interesting one too because as you habituate to it, it's almost like, well, I mean you habituate to it right so now uh it, it's it's almost like you're comparing it to whatever is normal because then the you know you've had your caffeine pre-workout for every session you know for the last year and now you say okay i'm going to skip it you feel like you're missing out on something well especially with the research supporting that it can still be ergogenic and provide you a benefit right. even when you've habituated so like there's this like thing in the back of your head, like kind of nociboing yourself a little bit. Like if I don't take it right, mm -hmm. like, I, you know, yes. And so like, even if you don't feel it, there's this thing in the back of your head saying, if I don't take it, I might be missing out on some benefit. Well, missing you know? out effect. Yeah. It's a, yeah. yeah. I used to be a lot more hardcore sure. about that in particular, like where I would, I don't know. I didn't, I didn't dabble really with caffeine at all. Uh, and then, I had kids. Yeah. I mean, you know, life, life. You know, it sounds like a joke, but that's, that's actually what happened. You know. Well, I, I go, I go way back with you, Mike. And I remember listening to you talk about that and, and your reasoning behind it was interesting of like, you didn't want to delay the kind of getting back into that rest, digest, you know, system kind of process. And you thought that like caffeine, while it could be helpful for performance, it doesn't help on the recovery front. So I thought that was really interesting, an interesting take on it. Like it prolongs this kind of, you know, getting back to that. Sure. And that was like a long time ago you said that. And and I remember you also saying like, you know, 80 milligrams of caffeine would, would send you through the roof and you had to be really careful because you were yeah, right, habituated right. to it. Oh, man, I wish. I know. Oh, that must have been nice. Uh, two or three <laughs> monsters just to feel normal. I'm kidding. But yeah. It, that was that was kind of my take on things then i mean i don't think this well i don't know I, I i suppose you could debate on whether the mechanism is right or wrong there's probably plenty of things going on that don't really depend on you know whatever uh amounts of caffeine that you still have circulating post workout um but then we usually aren't recovery limited in that way i would say i, I don't I, I don't think that that's the the main bottleneck in terms of our recovery capacity or ability to adapt uh, to training load is you know the remaining circulating caffeine so i'm I'm definitely not um, I definitely don't kind of lean that direction anymore <laughs> yeah I know the only real big issue is you know do I have enough caffeine in my right. system that it's keeping me awake longer than I intended and I'm losing sleep that's really the yeah. only that gets, factor I that's kind of insidious that. too um, maybe I'm just slow on the uptake for this but I've kind of run into a few I guess nights where um, I mean it, it, look if you train let's say in the late afternoon early evening and you have a, a big dose of caffeine at that point um, by bedtime, you no longer feel like wired and jittery. That's not the issue. You know, you're just not tired, you know, and mm -hmm. it, it can feel like, oh yeah. no, the caffeine's not affecting me anymore, you know, but it's just that it is because normally otherwise you would be sleepy. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You, you've, you've just you come just, down from the peak, you know, you just aren't yeah. sleepy yet, you know? So, mm -hmm. well, that's where like understanding half-life and some of those things are important to kind of consider. I think it's interesting because there's certain people that can take caffeine at, let's say five, six o'clock at night and be fine to go to bed at 10 or 11. They can be just fine. 
And then there's others that that could mean that you're up until one, two, three o'clock in the morning. And then there's, you can get into this whole debate of like, well, if you take caffeine at five or six and you still go to sleep at 10 or 11, what's, what kind of quality are you getting? So there's a lot there to unpack and still probably more to be done on it. But I, I think it is at least useful to track your own rhythms. Like one of the things I've been thinking about is when I dose my caffeine, how many times throughout the night do I get up? What kind of quality of sleep am I getting? And when I wake up in the morning, like on a scale of one to five, how tired am I? I think that's a good way to look at it is if I'm getting good quality sleep and I'm not waking up a whole lot throughout the night and I'm feeling reasonably recovered in my training, then I can feel happy about the pre-bedtime rituals and all those sort of things. But if I'm finding I'm waking up two, three times a night, or I have trouble falling asleep, like that time to sleep metric is, is impacted, or even, you know, I wake up and when I wake up, my fatigue levels are higher maybe making a slight alteration in dosage or timing of caffeine might make a big impact or skipping it entirely for certain sessions. And that's like another thing you could do kind of like an AB comparison, like, Hey, on Monday and Tuesday, I want to do the comp work. Let's, uh, let's throw it in there. Let's see how it goes. And then let's measure response at the end of the week. There's a whole bunch of problems with that, but that's something useful. I, I think that an individual can do to try to see their own sleep hygiene and how they're impacted by caffeine. Yeah. I definitely be down for kind of having the, uh, a B process if somebody needs caffeine for performance sake at the same time doesn't want to really lose a ton of sleep on the grand scheme of the, the week as a whole it's a nice middle yeah. ground there to get the best of both so i got a question for both of you it's ca- kind of weird but all right so i've been listening to huberman lab podcast and i heard him talk a little bit about some light exposure and helping with circadian rhythm and trying to make sure you're awake. And he's a proponent of like cold water immersion early in the morning. So I gave it a shot. I was like, I'm going to delay caffeine consumption for 90 to 120 minutes to see, because that's what his recommendation was. Let me give that a shot. And I took a cold shower. Like first thing waking up, took a cold shower. Not fun. Did not enjoy it. I, I was panting and breathing and I, you know, it was like I was having a heart attack. Short five minutes. Um, came out of the shower and felt like I got shot out of a rocket, right? So like, I felt like the, you know, all the adrenaline, right? And then I went outside and, you know, I got chickens. So I'm tending to my chickens, doing my thing, get my light exposure. And I didn't feel like I needed caffeine until like midday. And I was noceboing the hell out of it. I was like, this ain't going to work. This is cool, you know, and it, it actually did. Uh, so I'm curious, did, have you guys ever experimented with that or have any of your athletes report back on it? In my case, it'd be challenging to do so with, uh, uh, on most weekdays, I'm getting up at five, 10 in the morning and I'm on the mat by six. So to just get one foot in front of the other stone cold like that would be incredibly difficult. And just for sake of skin biome, it's generally not recommended to shower like, within, I think an oh, hour, sure. hour and a half of getting on the mat. So I, I couldn't even do a cold water immersion if I wanted to and case either it's interesting too i did see him put in a, a caveat saying that if you're engaging in high intensity activity that you can't it is permissible to consume caffeine before that 90 to 120 minute window as well but it's something i'd have to play around with on like a sunday to to test out but at that too it's like the one day of the week i'm like oh i can actually sleep past 8 a.m. This is incredible. I'm going to wake up at 1030. So I'm well past the get, you know, bright daylight <laughs> as the sun is cresting over the horizon. Um, and it's one of those things, too. I, I'm, I'm always interested in niche research that's kind of on the bleeding edge. But at the same time, when it comes to stuff that is on the bleeding edge and it's going against the grain of the consensus of the data, then it's like, OK, we we should pay attention to this and see how repetitive studies of this topic look in time. Again, these things are a nice way to open up the door for, hey, this is worth studying. We've seen some early effects that look promising. And I I think we should spend more time trying to see if we can get the same results with a similar uh, process here. But to take it on its own and be like, this is is the light, the truth, and the way. Sure. We're a a bit off from that. On the other hand, there is essentially no costs to something like that. So I would think the mm-hmm. downsides are yeah, it's worth a trial. pretty minimal. And, you know, I find that uh, 
being part of a there, there's some sort of like a group mentality that goes along with it like john I hear you describe it and now all of a sudden it sounds a lot more interesting to me you know but uh i i have messed around with like uh not first thing in the morning but just like the cold shower concept and it seemed like it worked for a while and then it kind of didn't work as much and you know it could be one of these things that is just like that you know that stimuli tend to run their course and and then what you know but uh, while it works then it works you know sorry go ahead i was just going to jump in and say i first heard about this maybe 10 years ago there was a, a medical student who talked about doing this as a strategy to not have to overconsume caffeine and to immediately get jolted awake as fast as possible. And what they did was they took cold water and splashed their face. First thing, woke up, feet hit the ground, walk over, splash the face. And I remember trying that and thinking, this actually works really well. You know, it's, it's a really big jolt. It's uncomfortable. And I found I didn't need caffeine right away. So I think it's interesting that we see some research with it and there's some protocols and more people are doing it. And again, I like the way that you put that, Mike, of we should be cautiously optimistic about these things. But at the end of the day, if there's some promising research and you'd like to try it, I mean, that's what matters the most is does it work for you? And like, like you said, Mike, uh, I'm going to have to differentiate you two because you're both Mike. Um, Mike T, uh, you know, you, I think, you know, you have a good point there about stimuli. We need to be careful about habituating to any stimuli. So it may work for a little while yeah. and then it may not. That's like Mike said too. We also have to look at cost benefit with this. Mm -hmm. And again, this in theory costs nothing at all. Maybe time if you have to change your sleep pattern and you have a lot of benefit due to again, down regulating our response to caffeine because we're less reliant on it. Perhaps you will be more sensitive to it when you need it, like yeah. when you go to go train or compete of some interesting applications. But, uh, particularly in the jujitsu community now, there's people getting cold tubs in their yards and. Here in the winter season, people are going out and literally picking it apart with an ice pick and jumping in. And it's tough for me to say, again, how much of this benefit is physiological versus just psychological, neurological. Um, it's, it's tough to really pinpoint. The one thing I do like about it is that it is it is a challenge, right? Both from a consistency standpoint, as well as just overcoming an incredibly uncomfortable stimulus um, so it's a nice way to give yourself yeah. some mental fortitude and be like, Hey, I did something really uncomfortable that I don't look forward to and you know, overcame that a, challenge, which is nice. I suppose there's some utility in the distinction between like, where's the benefit coming from? Um, but mm -hmm. at the same time, I'm not, it, you know, what it reminds me of people who, uh, will say things like, well, did you get stronger or did you just get better technique? Um, well, from a sporting standpoint, I'm better at my sport, and that's the that's the operating point, um, right? But it, it you know it also reminds me a bit like especially the part you were saying about like doing a bit more, doing something extra, uh, and doing something difficult to presenting yourself with a challenge. Something like a mentality that I've seen. I, I don't know if I want to just. Uh, slap it on the evidence-based side of, of fitness, but I think I see it maybe more on that side is just the, just the, uh, starting from the position of if I don't know for sure that there's a, a real tangible mechanistic benefit, then I'm going to err on the side of not doing it. I don't want to, I don't want to, uh, put mm -hmm. anything onerous on anybody metabolic window. That's a, or anabolic window. That's a myth. You don't have to have your protein shake after you work out. Just like, well, maybe not, but also it, it, it's not that hard, you know? And if you're really all about this, then right to you within 60 just, minutes, just do it and get a half a percent on your total after, you know, eight years. I, I don't know. Maybe it's, maybe it's that small, <laughs> but you know, mm -hmm. sure. I mean, well, that could be the margin of winning and losing. I, I just, I don't, have quite the same aversion to to asking that to doing that like if you have somebody who doesn't want to it's mm -hmm. important to kind of know okay this isn't that important in the grand hierarchy of things so you know 
maybe that's not the hill to die on, you know, but um, it's, mm. it also reminds me of um, like extra workouts, especially back when uh, like old school West side was a bigger thing. Uh, there was this concept of like doing these small, like 15 to 20 minute uh, workouts between the main sessions that were targeted at weak muscle groups or something like that. And it was, all supposed to be done in this very specific way. Um, but this idea of doing something extra or doing something before the training or after the training to help enhance the training, uh, that seems to be something that has really dropped off in, in its popularity. Um, but I think there's some utility, even just mm -hmm. social utility in like, Hey, we say that we're all about this and let's be all about it. You know, I can get down with that. I was going to add, I, I think going back to like, what's the cost of doing something like an intervention? I, I really like that thought, Mike, um, Mike T. I, my perfect example on that is branch chain amino acids, right? So look, <laughs> I, I did bodybuilding. It was very, very big, you know, back when I was doing bodybuilding and I still continue to use BCAAs. Is it the hill that I'm going to die on? No. If I go to the gym and I forget my BCAAs, I don't have a panic attack. I don't end my training session. I don't, you know, run home to go get it. I just, uh, wait, I am home. I trained here. Uh, I just, you know, I, I just move on. But you know what? It is something that I do think there is a slight bit of evidence that seems to suggest they could reduce fatigue. And if I can reduce fatigue by a very small portion, I'm willing to make the cost in BCAAs. If I can do that, because that means I could work out harder. And that is something I'm willing to, to invest in and do, even though the research is very limited. It doesn't seem to support that. It's going to improve uh, muscle growth or strength retention if you have enough protein in your diet. But it's something I'm willing to do because I'm willing to make that investment because it's certainly not going to hurt me. And that's, that's one of the things to kind of think about too with some of these things like we talk light exposure, caffeine consumption, um, really any of these things are extra workouts, you know, I, I think we also have to look at like, what's the cost in doing? Correct. And what's the ceiling for the benefit from this? Is this going to be something that can potentially make or break everything that I'm investing into this? Or is the, you know, detracting factor of it, if it doesn't go my favor, so it's because I'm not going to notice the lack of, okay. It's like you said, like with, in the case of you using BCAs, if you we was like, oh crap, I didn't take the my shaker bottle out with me. I don't have it on my hand. It's not like, oh my God, I wasted my training session. I can't do this. Right. It's like, oh, you know, there's so a, what? Um, mm -hmm. I hope I'm not just charging some windmills here, but maybe I am. Um, there's kind of a, a sneaky assumption that gets made here in some of these, uh, some of these arguments um, where maybe you talk about some, let's keep on the BCAA example. Um, maybe there's no benefit to it or very small benefit to it. Um, and, but maybe you say like, I don't, I don't mind, you know, putting the cost of it in terms of the, like the, the expense. Right. So you think, well, what's the downside? And, uh, someone might say, someone has said, I've heard that, uh, uh, yeah, it's not just the cost of it, but, it's the effort associated with it that you may have otherwise spent that effort on whatever else. But that kind of presupposes this relationship that uh, your effort is akin to a, a gas tank, you know, and you know what this reminds me of is like the, the willpower uh, paradigms that have kind of come and gone that Oh, your, your willpower is like a gas tank, you know, and you've got to conserve your willpower to be used on certain things. And, uh, you know, you don't want to utilize your willpower on other things like, well, and then it turned out that, yeah, that was true. If you believe that, if you believe bought into the gas tank analogy of willpower, but people that didn't, didn't seem to have that same effect. So I wonder how much of like, we don't really know what else there is, you know, does going to the extra effort of making your post-workout shake, like, even though, yeah, that what's the additional recovery utility of having it like right after your last set versus, you know, an hour later, really not that much, but 
we don't necessarily know that that withdraws from your uh, your willpower bank account. It could help to create additional habits now that now you're thinking about uh, recovery and shifting into a, a different recovery mindset. Or it could be any number of things, but we don't want to kind of sneak in this assumption that it's it's uh, like a, this zero sum scenario. Right. Like it's coming at a significant cost. And now because of that cost, I'm less able to do sure. whatever else I have set forth. I have a yeah. good example of that. When I take the BCAAs intra workout, they're with, they're with a high glycemic carbohydrate and they're also with creatine. So if the BCAAs do nothing, if they do nothing whatsoever, and you think about the level of effort, it actually reminds me to take creatine. It reminds me to take it which we know yeah. through research has a substantial benefit for athletes, right? So it's like when you think of those things, that's where patterning and behaviors become a little bit more complex than the willpower right. analogy like you gave because it could actually be um, pro-supportive of another behavior which actually has well, It's more like weighing impact. yourself every day if you're trying to lose weight. Like it, should it matter? Well, it shouldn't matter. Like you don't need daily adjustments to your calorie intake, but- it just turns out that weighing yourself every day keeps it top of mind. And, you know, I, I wonder what other things are similar to that. Like if you go out to the gym and you do some extra sets of band pushdowns uh, between your main workouts, like it probably doesn't have a big uh, tax in terms of your recovery abilities. It's also probably not doing a whole lot for you uh, in terms of like adding to your 1RM bench, but you're thinking about your bench you're doing something, you know, you're, at least it creates a perception of uh, like taking this thing under control, which I suppose that could be a, a two edged sword as well. Yeah. I was just about to say, because it may become hyper like fixated yeah. on your performance. Then yeah. in so, I mean, negative any way. of these things, I suppose, can pretty much anything can be taken too far. Right. So, I, I suppose some mm -hmm. of that kind of pushback and, um, you know, kind of tendency toward like, well, is this really doing anything for you? If not, then maybe you ought to consider cutting it out. You know, some of that is warranted, you know, um, especially, you know, mm -hmm. when you start looping in, uh, ideas about like athlete identity and, uh, <laughs> what's, what's best for your mental health mm -hmm. in the long run here. Um, totally. That's one of those things like the, the common example I'd give that fits into this topic yeah. is something like foam rolling. Again, it's something that's still pretty ubiquitous. You'll see it in almost any gym with the population that takes strength training relatively seriously, whether it's for sport performance or for powerlifting and weightlifting purposes. You'll still see a good handful of people engaged. In. And for most people, again, if they're like, it doesn't add any stress to my day, like I've kind of already fit this time into my schedule and the rest of my routine is pretty okay. And I just enjoy doing it. Okay, there's nothing wrong with that. But if somebody's like, oh, you know, it's just such a hassle to be here for three hours. I'm like, well, not for nothing. We spent half an hour foam rolling, which don't really need to do if you don't want to do it. Then that seems like, to me, the obvious thing to be, hey, why don't you just try to cut that out or cut it in half yeah. and go from yeah. there. But then again, on the flip side, again, how much do we now create a nocebo effect for that person who's like, oh, well, I really think it loosens me up. And if I don't do it, I don't think I'll be able to attain suitable depth for my squat and my early sets so again how how much is it worth pushing back on some of these things that people have gotten ingrained sure. in before you get a little bit well, of the additional effects. context i don't know it's important with it, coaching it's right such a well, with that example in particular do you ever run into mm -hmm. people who've kind of i guess back themselves into a corner with something like foam rolling where they've like they've been doing it they really notice uh, that, that that there's a benefit to it, that when they don't do it, uh, let's take squatting, for example. If they don't show up early and do their soft tissue work, then it's painful and they may not be able to complete the session. Or if they get there and they take care of their mm -hmm. soft tissue stuff, then they're able to train. I haven't in a long time, to be honest. Um, and maybe it's just because of the conversations I have with like I've worked with in person for rehab purposes and they've like, Oh, I've stopped foam rolling years ago for most of these people. It's pretty rare that I come across people 
that seek me out who are really engaged in that kind of stuff. I don't know if just by nature of the person I am and the belief system I have or whatever. But every once in a while, I have people who are engaged in it. They ask, like, do you think this is helpful? And probably because I tend to flip around, like, do you think it's helpful? And to them, they're like, yeah, I, I think I know some better. I'm like, all right, well, if it's not, you know, again, causing you a ton of extra time to perform this, you can continue on it. But again, if you're going to say that, oh, like it takes up so much of my time, and I get home late, then I'm like, well, maybe you do want to cut it out. But going back to the lifter, it's like, yeah, I've really noticed if I don't do it, I have this, you know, seemingly negative effect here and my squats suffer from it. It's going to be an uphill battle, but it might be one that I do engage in with kind of delving into how it really causes such a small temporal effect on just our perception of stiffness and maybe that there's a way that we can bypass this or shortcut the process of getting things to feel comfortable enough or less stiff enough that we can get under the bar and have less discomfort. And that might be something that kind of goes into looking at other controllables. Okay, well, what's your nutrition look like? What does your water intake look like? How's your sleep? How's your general life stress, et cetera? And we might come to find that this person has a very high stress job, their home life is a little rocky, whatever. And so there might be other stuff to unpack here rather than just, well, you've got a relatively predictable, low stress lifestyle who, for whatever reason, just feels that they need, absolutely need to foam roll. Otherwise, they feel, you know, they actually physically feel worse when they go to squat. Um, and in that case, just kind of almost proving to them, like, hey, what if we regress the squat a little bit? What if we try just a couple lunges in place or some wall sits or even just some leg extensions and stick it under the bar instead? with something that takes you half the time, actually uses these muscles, and lo and behold, maybe you feel better. And maybe they don't. Um, so it's always just a question of, again, cost-benefit. To how Are these things coming out such high of a cost that's not sure. worth the benefit that they perceive from it? Yeah. Or are they pretty okay with it? It's such a, a funny topic because, again, we know it doesn't cause any substantial long-term changes to tissues and that all the effects seem to be neurological and they tend to be very short-lived but for some people who again just kind of abide by it and it's their norm okay i'm not super inclined to change unless they're complaining again I, time is of the essence i like what you said about uh potentially subbing in some different uh different types of warm-up movements i mean it, it occurred to me um mm -hmm. one of the one of the, the benefits that you might see is like just generally low load moving around <laughs> you know that for a lot of people especially mm -hmm. uh, you know let's say masters lifters uh you've accumulated some miles and the body can feel pretty stiff just without doing anything you know you, you don't have to necessarily mess anything up to feel stiff and immobile <laughs> right uh, well and, run down and even somewhere. like i can imagine even to the point where you go, ah, oh, we'll just start with the bar. Well, that doesn't necessarily feel great either. Like imagine, you know, you haven't trained in two weeks right. and uh, you came back and did your first squat session back and, you know, like cripplingly sore, we usually feel after that, right? Now imagine you've got to, while you feel that sore, you've got to come mm -hmm. back and do another squat session for whatever reason. Um, that, yeah, oh, just start with the bar. Like, well, <laughs> that's still pretty difficult you know maybe it's to the point where just like doing some mm -hmm. just general moving around uh helps things loosen up enough to where you can start with the bar and that's i like the idea mm -hmm. of just well let's do some body weight maybe some some low step ups into lunges into some wall sits and like i really like the idea of um bringing in some isometrics uh to especially like in those early warmups mm -hmm. Greg used Greg Knuckles used to talk about that about like in the first couple warm up sets that he would do just like this ten second pause in the bottom position and just helped helped his joints feel a little bit better mm -hmm. and even now like if I'm feeling particularly stiff I'll make sure to do that in some of the early warm up sets it does seem to just help get things moving a little bit better you know um, yeah that, I think that's a mm -hmm. that's a good idea yeah. I said, it's a, it's a nice middle ground between just start with the bar yeah. and start with half an hour foam rolling. It's one of those things, again, it could 
be something that takes you as little as five extra minutes. Maybe it takes 15. And I think it's going to be so individually based, it's hard to come up with any quick recommendations for anybody. There's some people who like going on the Airdyne bikes and they're on there for 10 minutes at a moderate to ending with a high pace. There's some people who, again, I've seen people knock out like a set of 20 leg extensions. They take it to a decent level. You know, it's not easy, but it's not the hardest thing that they've done yet today in their training. And then they'll go and get under the bar. There's some people who do some lunges. So there's no shortage of ideas on how can I move my body outside from under the bar to get myself acclimated and feel that I'm not going to be super achy on that first rep. It's something that I did for a while. Uh, I don't know. It's like one of these little things in training that comes and goes in spurts. Uh, caring about general health. I don't, I don't know why I bother with that. But we would, I would uh, <laughs> occasionally I'll think to myself like, well, you know, I spend a lot of time doing powerlifting specific training and it's very narrow in focus and start to think, hey, there's all these other ways of moving your body that are essentially untrained. And not that I need to be world class at any of that, but it's probably a good idea to maintain movement abilities as I continue to get older, you know? Mm -hmm. So it seemed like a a reasonable thing to do. I've noticed that Bryce Lewis does this. His reasoning might be different though, but uh, in the beginning of his training sessions, he does this just a, a light barbell complex, you know? A few RDLs, a few bent over rows, a few overhead presses, mm-hmm. a few of this, a few of that, you know. And it doesn't have to be heavy or involved or elaborate, but, you know, I remember thinking like, well, I mean, if you did, like, took your, your say you're going to do a bench workout and you take your very first warm-up weight and you do what, however many flat bench reps you do and then sit up and then just overhead press it until you feel like stopping. I mean, it doesn't have to be a stimulus, but you've mm-hmm. moved in that range of motion and chances are you'll continue to be able to move in that range of right. motion. <laughs> yeah. Right. You could yeah. you could express I, being there. I think that's probably a good idea in the long run. You mean to tell me that I, I should be able yeah, to actually yeah, find my back let's not get crazy. Walk my back pocket at some point in my <laughs> I'm, life. I'm a two hundred and sixty five pound <laughs> man. Let's not go, yeah. go crazy. <laughs> Funny. I wanted to uh add to the conversation psychologically for a second here. Um if we think of someone who has a very high stress job, very high stress life, let's say they finish their day at work and they've got to commute, they're getting to the gym. So maybe they're not moving a lot at work. They're dealing with high stress. They're dealing with traffic. And then they get to the gym. Foam rolling in and of itself may provide that transition from being sedentary and in a very high stressful situation into something that's movement-based and is helping to create distance from that stressor. And psychologically, it could be having the benefit to prepare them for the training that they're about to do that might be different than getting under a barbell because getting under the barbell might start to, in some way, get them thinking about the top sets, get a little bit of nerves going, thinking about the training loads that they're going to be using. And there may be some sort of undulation in stress management that might be happening with something like that. Uh, I certainly know that was the case for me back when I did foam rolling after using a story like that, after a high stressful work day and then commuting and getting to the gym, it would feel like a transition, but that transition could happen with getting on a treadmill and walking, or like you said, Mike, uh, you know, being able to use a, a bike or something like that. It could be any one of these modalities for one of my athletes. It's like walking in the snow for like 15, 20 minutes to get to the train, to get to the gym. It's like, you know, whatever it is, it creates some sort of intentional time to be thinking about training, to be getting excited for it, potentially be getting excited for movement, um, which could be pro supportive of yeah. that. Yeah. I, I definitely think, um, like you said, a nice transition point and similar to what you were saying before, it kind of helps support the other habits too. Like in going back to the case of taking the BCA, it's like, well, I mix it with my creatine and natural workout car again. It's kind of the vehicle for the other good habits. In which case, again, there's nothing wrong with modality. It's just a question of how effective is this for what you think it's doing for you? Is there a better and shorter method? And that's really all it is. And it's nice to see, again, a lot of people who were in the camp of, like, nobody should ever full enroll, have kind of walked away to got to the point of, like, can if you like it. And that's really about where 
I think most reasoned people are at. Yeah. Good old pendulums. I suppose Mm -hmm. that would be kind of where I come down on it as well, that there are reasons to like some of these things and it may not be the, the original mechanistic reason that we thought, uh, but you know, that's, it's all right. It's not harming anything. Um, again, other than in the extreme cases, creating a nocebo effect, but I don't think that's going to be yeah. most people. I don't think most people are going to be in that camp of, I didn't get the foam roll for 20 minutes. It was only 10 minutes. And now well, I just kind of so understanding of that one minute factor, kind of the full picture of what do we, what do we know? What do we think we know about where this is at? You know, mm-hmm. yeah. totally. I think, you know, talking about magnitude of effect is important, you know, and like you can get into that with training too, right? Like, oh, I didn't get to get all my volume in. Does that mean the training session is not effective? Or, you know what, I didn't get to this accessory or this movement today. Does that mean that I'm not going to be able to take progression and load next week or next session or whatever it may be? Or I didn't progress this week. Does that mean that this training block's not going well? It's like you start to look at some of these things and think, well, magnitude of effect. Like if you had to cut some of your volume out, does that mean that the rest of the volume didn't matter or that it won't have some sort of effect? You know, I, part of, part of me thinks, and two, like, since we're talking to a, a doctor of physical therapy, when we think about uh, injuries, it could be actually pretty supportive in, in some circumstances to cut out a little bit of work that could actually be really helpful. You know, that could actually be a stress reduction, you know, that actually could mm-hmm. prepare you for the next session. So I think like looking at magnitude of effect is important. And I think one of our roles as coaches is to help educate our clients that way. It's like, look, foam rolling, probably temporary, probably not going to give you a whole lot. You know, if you find it helpful, continue. But I certainly wouldn't get in the way is probably a good way to look at it. I wouldn't get in the way or butt up against your training session because of it. And if it's something that helps you to prepare and helps you to get under the bar, then cool, let's do it. But let's not take 30 minutes or something that would eat into the volume that we could get in the session, magnitude of effect. Do it for a couple of minutes right. and transition in. The thing that's going to matter for health, longevity, strength, powerlifting, is going to be the time you put under the bar. You know? I think... Uh, Great point on that one. I, I kind of... You, you mentioned the, the separation from, you know, kind of whatever day-to-day grind into the training session, John. There's a lot you can a lot you can notice about that if you pay attention to it and i I noticed just yesterday just this general reluctance to get into my training session that kind of dragged my feet for a while and i mean i don't i think that's part of it you know that some days that's the reality and i mean if uh foam rolling or or whatever i mean we kind of are harping on foam rolling here but you know it it's like it's a stand-in for Walking any the of these mill, whatever. Like, uh, minor activities. Mm-hmm. And in fact, um, I would say I've noticed lately a tendency toward uh, I don't know, like a like a, a somewhat of a circuit style warm up. I've seen people doing uh, that'll usually uh, have a couple prehabby type movements uh, and some isolation bodybuilding type movements, uh, and that's you know, integrated in mm-hmm. like part of the pre barbell warm up. Um, okay. I mean, that can kind of fill the same role. You know, anytime I've said foam rolling, you could, we could be talking about that too, <laughs> you know, that, uh, right. Yeah. Just something that demarcates and starts to transition the mindset of like, Oh, like work, blah, blah, blah. To Yeah. All right. I'm actually kind of getting excited to train now. Just something to, help flip that switch and not make it a zero yeah. to hundred. I had a friend of mine who a uh, had a home gym uh, years ago. And uh, whenever he would train after he was done, he just left all his crap out. Uh, so for, I, I've for him, done that too, actually. You know, it was part of his ritual because whenever he would go out to the gym, the first thing he would do is clean up and, you know, you're unloading the bars and you're putting everything mm. away and, you know, and for him, it was just a little bit of this light movement. Uh, you know, he's kind of feeling how everything, feeling how the body is doing uh, while he's doing all this. But he's also, you know, just coming in that environment and separating out from the workday and all that stuff as well. Yeah, yeah I definitely think it, it's nice to have something like that that allows for yeah. a smoother transition. So is there anything from an injury management standpoint 
that you seem to have anecdote of or potentially even evidence of that could be useful in the warm-up time for athletes to do like hey evidence suggests doing this thing or you know not doing this thing that would be supportive of somebody getting under the bar not much i mean anecdotally i myself was one of the people it's like i just go in throw on my knee sleeves my shoes and get right underneath the bar to squat that was just kind of my thing and then you have other people who are very big on I really just like to hit the bike for 10 minutes, raises my heart rate. I like to start my squats feeling already a little sweaty and warm. Um, so it's really going to come down to the individual level because, again, so much of our warm-up with actually progressively adding weight to the bar is going to take care of most things. You know, We're going to get our nervous system acclimated to the loads that we want to handle. We're going to get our body temperature warmed up by progressively hitting more and more repetitions as we go on. Um, so by and large, I, I wouldn't say that there's any good to suggest that having specific systems in place are going to, I should say specific systems in place as like a pre-lifting ritual to reduce injury likelihood here. Like, because you see a lot of physical therapists um, or physios just in general talk about some of this stuff on social media. Like mm -hmm. you should do this big five complex or you should do this thing for 10 minutes because it does <laughs> i think it's called the mcgill big three i know i was trying not to say it out loud but thanks thanks mike um <laughs> well since you threw the word big in there i, know. I, I shouldn't like, have said uh, big. here's the These five. Here's the low-hanging fruit yep, yep well now that's the, out there the medium five. so uh, <laughs> are there are there the medium five um yeah you hear people talk about this almost like it's like if you don't do this you will get hurt nocebo if you, mm -hmm. you know any data to support that any anything there again it's a, it's a lot of smoke with no real substance to back it up um but again that's not to say going back to the whole discussion we we're having before minimal cost by and large but potentially you have somebody that's just that much more comfortable getting right the bar not the end of the world and again it's just whether or not it's worth having a discussion with that person of Hey, you don't really have to do this if, again, if you're like, ah, I'm not seeing a benefit. It's like, okay, well, if you're not perceiving that you have a benefit to it, it's time that runs course and we can move on from it. But on the flip side, if somebody's feeling that they absolutely need to do it and it seems to have a big psychological benefit from them and physiologically they feel a little bit more prepared, not the end of the world. Uh, there, there are worse things that they keep doing for sure, but. Yeah, you know, it's just a matter of from the coaching side and from my side too, is it worth having these discussions on expected benefits and opportunity costs or do we just let live, live here? And I'm pretty okay with it. Again, so long as that person is not advising the next person in line who's like, Oh, my back is a little sore when I go to squat, like what 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 can I do? And that person is doing the we'll call it the media five, uh, to to not going into a popular one uh so this person's doing the media fires like oh you have to be doing this i can't believe you haven't been doing this you don't you're going to be taking a one-way trip to snap city because that's still a place to snap city seal still real anymore <laughs> you're dating know. yourself man i know um and, and and so so long as somebody's not having that kind of discussion where again they're creating this nocebo for the next person in line i'm pretty impenetrable to just this could definitely turn into a large. segment of the podcast where we hold up different icons and you knock them down. Um, but just at the risk of continuing with the pattern here, um, I, I wondered, you know, we're, so we're kind of skirting around this topic of, of core training uh, or training, you know, muscles mm -hmm. around the trunk. Uh, and I've wondered about that. Um, sure. I guess, you know, more, medium to long-term, more serious core training, uh, perspective. Um, I don't, I mm -hmm. don't buy into the idea that squatting and deadlifting and just, just squatting and deadlifting is sufficient for the muscles of the trunk to be trained other than the spinal rectors. You know, I, I just, I can't imagine that, mm -hmm. that, you know, your rectus abdominis is trained just from this. Uh, I don't know right. 
the extent that it really needs to be. But, you know, generally things mm -hmm. are probably better if they've been at least a little bit trained. I do think that, I mean, would you agree with that, that things that are completely untrained tend to be um, maybe a, a bit less resilient when put under load? Totally. And it's going to be a matter of when does this person experience this sure. context of having to use these muscle groups. And in a power lifter, it's going to be rare that we have to directly use our rectus abdominis for Things have gone quite squatting wrong or deadlifting. Point. <laughs> for somebody like me, yeah, exactly. Where, you know, we've got somebody coming up helicoptering. It's like, oh, and now I have an ab strain. Well, yeah, we weren't really prepared to try to decelerate <laughs> a spinning barbell under load here. Um, so it, it's pretty rare that we'd run into that. But for somebody like me, who I have to use my rectus abdominis to just sit up off the mat quickly and explosively it kind of behooves me to spend some time doing a little bit of direct work in these areas to build some resistency and some capacity for work uh, in that nature. So when it comes to the core for a power lifter, is it necessary for sport performance? Not necessarily. Is it necessary for reducing likelihood of injury in the context of power lifting? Probably not. But when it comes to reducing likelihood of injury for just day-to-day -day stuff or just for the unanticipated, yeah, it's, it's probably appropriate in that case. So it's just always a matter of sure. context more than anything else. Um, and there's infinite modalities. And we've gone through so many phases of like, don't don't ever do a crunch. <laughs> to like, Crunches are the best thing you could ever do. Um, Should never so hope for anything better. This is always funny. I mean, we, we see this all the time. Yeah, I mean, there, there's a plethora of videos like that in the nutrition world kind of poking fun at that topic where it's like, get all of your saturated right. fats. Oh, just kidding, saturated fats are terrible, back and forth. And again, the, the truth yeah. is generally usually in the middle I, ground. I think that lots of people who compete in powerlifting, even people that compete in powerlifting, uh, that's not the only, that may not even be the main reason that they lift. It becomes... Uh, a good reason to keep lifting, you know? Uh, so I, I mm -hmm. wonder about that in some of these different contexts, you know, like you usually don't have to convince uh, power lifters too hard to do some, do a few sets of biceps. It's not really directly helping your, your power lifting. So why are you, why are you doing that? It's because you have other motivations to lift weights that are not strictly sport oriented. Right. And I don't know. I, I think lots of people, who find themselves in competitive powerlifting are just interested in being strong people, you know, and it's worth remembering that there's mm -hmm. other things outside of you know, the competition powerlifts. And it reminds me of, uh, I guess a little bit more than a year ago, as I was kind of reintroducing into squatting, uh, and deadlifting, getting ready to, uh, compete again. Most of my lower body training had been centered mm -hmm. around, uh, front squats and really anterior focused quad movements, you know, split squats and uh, belt squats and things like that, right? Um, so as I get back mm -hmm. into deadlifting, you know, throughout most of the reintroduction period, everything is easy. And as the weight continues to increase, it doesn't, it doesn't stay that way, but it's still extremely low uh, training volumes. It's like one hard set a week on each lift, you know, it was just not a lot in the mm -hmm. beginning. And I remember uh, deadlifting, it, it was like a moderately difficult set. And on the last rep of the deadlift, I strained a hamstring. It wasn't serious. It was fairly minor, right? Mm. And I um, you know, have never really had hamstring issues throughout training, you know, really ever. Uh, so that was new to me. And I talked to... Um, Dr. Megan Jones, uh, who also does office hours for us and, and everything in the mm -hmm. training lab, uh, talk to her about it. And I mean, anytime you come up with a story about like, well, why did I get injured? It's definitely just a story. And it's important not to put too much faith into the stories that we tell about it. But it, it also helps to draw a box around this mm -hmm. thing and kind of help figure out where to go from here. So in, in my case, our uh, hypothesis was that uh, as the uh, weight got heavier, the 
load the demand for hip extension torque mm -hmm. goes up and since the basically the muscles in my posterior chain except for spinal rectors were still well trained from all the front squats but glutes hamstrings probably not as much um as you you reach the mm -hmm. limit of the glutes and adductors ability to produce torque hamstrings start to get recruited in hamstrings are relatively untrained and then uh you can get to a mm -hmm. A point where mm -hmm. the the load demand exceeds their capacity you get a, a minor strain you know so i Correct. thought well okay that's interesting and you know kind of a, a hole in the game of my prior training something that i could have uh done something about had i foreseen it you know um you know even probably even just a, a set or two of hamstring training would have uh, would have been very helpful, you know, or at least pushing that off. Um, mm -hmm. So I think about that type of mechanism in other contexts that kind of provides some background into the abs question. But, you know, I have similar similar thoughts around triceps right. and the bench and basically anything where the training the competition lift itself is insufficient uh, to develop uh, some of the supporting muscles. Totally. I mean, going back to what we were talking about before with just giving a power to a set or two of curls, I mean, how much of our typical competition training <laughs> really involves the bicep at any meaningful level? Right. The answer is almost zero. Um, so again, just having a capacity to produce, handle, and adapt to mechanical stress sure. in these contexts isn't a bad thing. Um, it's just also it goes back to the question of how much time and how much energy do we want to put into training these things and what's the ceiling for training these things before it starts to bleed into okay now i'm a little bit too fatigued to perform at the optimal yeah. level i want to for my competition training and it's it's like you said it's tough to look back at some of these moments and be like oh crap i really haven't loaded up my hamstrings in forever and now they just weren't prepared for that sudden Hey, everything else is fatigued out. It's time to time for you guys to go. Right. And lo and behold, I had nothing there for it. Um, it's kind of tough to say if and or when will this happen to somebody in the competition lift. Um, and we can never really predict these things. We can never be like, oh yeah, he's definitely got a an insufficiency here, and we don't know until we find out. Unfortunately, we don't know where the that ceiling for adaptation and force production of a yeah. given unit lies yeah. until. I can't remember if it was you that I heard talking about this or, or maybe someone else, but just that um, our capacity to do something like prevent injury. Uh, I don't even know how you would go about measuring something like that, but doing things that would reduce your injury mm -hmm. risk, that's probably more in the realm of possibility. Yeah. It, yeah, it's, it's such a, a murky ground and we've talked about, changing the terminology back and forth again the, there's a pendulum with this too with going from talking injury prevention to injury risk reduction and then people are like oh aren't these kind of synonymous so now we go back to just using injury prevention because it's a lot shorter and easier to point across here yeah it's just tough to say how much of what we do in any regard is really going to have a big impact for reducing likelihood sure. of a an, an event happening we could just never account for the randomness that life is unfortunately both under the barbell in a fairly predictable set like you had with uh, your deadlift like i've had on many of my competition lifting sessions where it was either a pec strain or a hamstring strain in my case for the the main ones i had dealt with and it could be on a pretty for me it was routine sets it wasn't even something that was pushing the limits just for whatever reason that area of my body just said we're not adapting to this today sorry well actually it's technically a, a disrupt you know, an acute strain is an adaptation it's just not a favorite one but and it's an instantaneous <laughs> one at that um but yeah yeah well the the, uh, the other thing too is it's sometimes you can say it's possible to look at workload look at someone's chronic workload and acute workload and say that might have been the 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 thing that pushed it over right that might mm -hmm. have been the event this training week where you decided to take your volume up 30 percent versus what you're used to might have been the culprit 
But then, and that's a little bit easier for us to digest as lifters and as coaches. What's harder is when you have a lifter who's warming up and they're using like 30% loads or just a bar on their back Mm -hmm. and then their knee bothers them or their back bothers them. It's so hard to come up with a narrative to explain that. So yeah, what do? I don't think there is a a great one. That's the tough thing. It's like, okay, we just make do with the situation at hand then. Um, And that's in the rehab field when it comes into getting into the discussion between how important is diagnosis versus how favorable is your prognosis. And again, when it comes to something like the shoulder, we have a lot of different tissues in a relatively small area and you'd be splitting hairs like, oh, this is definitely infraspinatus versus supraspinatus. It's like, well, what's the matter? What, what does the potential for a favorable outcome look like with rehabilitating this thing? And so similar with this person who was like, yep, I took the, just took a warm set with bar. I came up on the fifth rep and all of a sudden my back went out to these common phrase here. And it's like, well, don't have a great explanation as to why, but here's what we yeah, can do. We um, take people in similar situations and bring them back to you know, a normal, normal pattern. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Because again, you, you could spend an endless amount of, energy both you know physiologically speaking but more from just a mental standpoint of just trying to continue to answer the question of why and at some point it's just not serving you anymore we kind of have to move past the well why did this happen to me and start getting proactive about this thing like let's let's take the process here and put one foot in front of the other and get back to where we want to go to which is easier said than done i mean any sort of unforeseen hiccup or in this case a large bump in the road of our training, you know, it does derail us. It does take us out of the moment and it causes a priority shift and potentially a shift in the petition schedule and everything else and big shift in what training is going to look like for the next couple of weeks, potentially, or even sure. a couple of months adding up. Um, but all you can do is just yeah, play I, with the hand I that you're done. kind of when I was in the earlier stages of dealing with my uh, kind of long-term injury, then uh, uh, we had tried mm-hmm. a bunch of things. Uh, at, when I say we, I mean, I can't remember which therapist I was working with at the time. I worked with quite a, quite a lot of them over the couple of years. But um, oh, yeah. we've kind of been going through several things uh, that we thought it might be. We got to the point where uh, they recommended that I go get an MRI. I remember kind of thinking through the same sort of thing, like, I didn't know if I really wanted to do that because I thought I've been lifting weights for like almost 20 years, you know, and I didn't expect good news. <laughs> and I thought, uh, what's, mm-hmm. what are we going to learn from this? That's going to really affect our, our course. Um, which in my case, I, it ended up going through with it anyway, and actually was pleasantly surprised, uh, against, against the odds, I guess. Uh, where things came back and were like, hey, actually, your spine looks great. And I thought, well, that's nice. <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, they're, they're like, well, I'm still you in know, pain, though. we don't think it's Whereas this. You you know, there's this, like this one tiny little thing that maybe that's what's causing your issue, but we don't really, other than that, everything looks great. You know, I thought, well, that is literally the best I could have hoped mm-hmm. for from an MRI <laughs> at this point. Right. Rather than the, the right. classic response of, you've got the back of an 80-year-old. It's like, well, number one, what's an 80-year-old's back look like? And number two, right. that wasn't right. a helpful comment, so thank you. Um, but more often than not, we've, um, people tend to be on the opposite end of the spectrum where they might have what I'd call an incidental finding where something has, like in your case, like assumption of like, I'm going to find stuff on here that's probably been around for years. And what this person thinks like, oh, this... This happened overnight. This is this is the driver of the pain that I'm experiencing, and I'm like, and in those cases too, I, I try to walk that line pretty well. Like, I'm not really outright challenging them, but maybe trying to guide them towards a more evidence-based narrative and get them into a little bit more thinking along the biopsychosocial pathway here. But um, I, I try to ask them like, okay, now we have this. How do you think this changes our process that we're going to be going through? And they're like, well. You're the doctor. You tell me. Like, <laughs> well, it doesn't really change much of anything. We're still looking for what's what's our point of entry into the stuff that you want to get back into. 
what other things can we do to create a favorable environment for adaptation and how do we progress these things over time? Because so it, it's, it's kind of a, a funny discussion to have sometimes. And I, I've had it with a couple people recently, actually, both of them pretty young lifters. I think one's like 17, one might be around like 21, 22. And they're like, hey, I, I really think I need to get an imaging, imaging done first. And I just think, why? What, what, what will this do for you? And it goes back to this idea of like, I'll find the, the root cause. I'm like, I try to go pretty light with this discussion of reductionism and mechanistic thinking. And I get into the explanation that, again, we have these incidental findings of different pathologies, even in that young of a population many people will show signs of wear and tear was the, the classic way of thinking. But again, we'll find things like in the shoulder, some labral pathologies or minor rotator cuff strains and things of that nature. And again, it's a question of how much this actually preexisted, how much of this might actually be new and explaining some of what you're going through. But really the, the big question is how does this change your prognosis and how does this change the process that we want to go through? And the answer is, Probably not much unless we found serious pathology, which in the case of somebody who's still going in and performing a competition lift with some minor modifications, probably don't have a serious pathology. There's nothing to really rule out on imaging at this stage. Detached a muscle. You you really don't need a, you don't need an MRI. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) You you know, you know, before you get the MRI. You can see a, yeah, yeah. It's tougher when it comes to something like the low back where you have the classic, I felt a pop right in the, the center of my low back. And it's like, well, again, like, was this a acute disc herniation? Was this an acute uh, intervertebral joint sprain? Was this a muscle strain? Tougher to sort out. Again, it doesn't really change the process that you're going to go through. But yeah, most people who get an acute, actual, complete rupture usually know it. Um, if not, in the moment, maybe next day when there's a nice yeah. amount of bruising going yeah. on. See a yeah. couple of those every once in a while. But then the discussion too is, especially in the case of bicep tears, it's like, is it actually worth reattaching this thing? That's always a fun discussion. Um, what was interesting was one of the most, more recent people that I had this discussion with was uh, a black belt from Jiu-Jitsu. And um, he came to me before going to an orthopedic and I was like, uh, I hate to tell you, but this thing is actually detached. Like, have a distal bicep tendon attached right now um like you can go through a conservative approach with this without going through surgery but we have a purple belt at our school who's actually an upper extremity orthopedic i've talked to him a bunch he's actually a pretty sound guy doesn't immediately oh we need surgery oh we need injection he's very much of the mindset of like hey this stuff actually just gets better in time even with no added effort so like go go see john and uh you know, just follow up with me afterwards and let me know what he thinks. And uh, the sort of, John was actually like, hey, I actually would not operate on this. If jujitsu is the main activity that you want to get back to, uh, I would actually just rehab this thing. I would leave it as is and just start to strengthen the remaining elbow flexors that you have, and you'll probably be okay. And lo and behold, within four months, he's doing pretty okay. Um doesn't have the same max force capacity that his uninjured arm has. No. Was he within 90%? Yeah. So it's just a matter of, you know, again, are we going to be splitting hairs at that level or is that going to make all the difference in the world? In his case where, well, he's a very accomplished black belt and he's a hell of a person to deal with on the mat. He doesn't compete. There's something really at stake. It's just training for him. It's just a a way that he kills time. You do all his day-to-day stuff. So in his case, probably the yeah, right decision the, here the um risk of things going especially uh, the risk of any intervention really uh going not according to plan is something that can be underappreciated and that was the main part of the discussion particularly in that compartment of the elbow it, it's like look like things happen a nerve can get nicked you might lose some sensation to certain fingers you might lose the capacity to actually make a, a full fist as well as you like to uh, you can have a negative reaction to the anesthesia. Who knows? Um, that's not to say that, again, like if you need life-saving surgery, to have second thoughts. But, just that there are um, risks to these things and they are like you know, actual for some of these risks. Sports. They're, not, they're not just like, oh, well, that's... Uh, Correct. I don't know. It, it depends on 
the specifics and I'm well outside my lane by describing a lot of this stuff, but sometimes they're uh, minutely rare and then sometimes they're surprisingly not that rare, you know, so doing, doing a bit of mm -hmm. uh, diligence and trying to understand that uh, is, is really useful and having medical people uh, around you that uh, understand that as well. I've been pleasantly surprised by interactions with the medical community over the last, it seems like it's gotten better over the last several years where, uh, medical professionals, at least the ones that I've been in contact with are a lot more willing to talk about, uh, upsides and downsides and possibility for the unexpected and things like that. It's been much less, uh, mm -hmm. absolutism, which is nice to see. Yeah, absolutely. Again, I, I sure. think that should have always been part of the discussion is like, Hey, here's some potential side effects and these are very low probability. And these ones happen as many as 25% of people. You know, it's nice to kind of have that knowledge before you make the decision, especially in the case of, uh, elective orthopedic surgeries, where again, there's mixed evidence for some things. And again, context dependent, some things just aren't sure. necessary to actually. Well, it, it reminds um, me of, uh, changes that we see I... in coaching as well that uh, uh, we did a, a seminar mm -hmm. some years ago and um, one of the gentlemen in, the, in attendance uh, commented about like how different coaching was compared to like when he was uh, in school, like on a basketball team, that it, it's gone from the coach was mm -hmm. kind of the, the general and you do as do as you're told kind of thing to where it's a much more collaborative sort of relationship. Uh, and we were kind of musing over like, what the possible reasons for that change have been. And the uh, availability of information mm -hmm. seems like a, a good contender. You know, if somebody's telling you, um, I don't know, you need to uh, do a bunch of foam rolling to loop back in a prior example. Um, you need to do a bunch of foam rolling. And then I go and Google it. And I'm like, well, wait, actually, uh, this person says that this other person says this other thing you know, I want coach to be able to explain this. Like, why does it, why does it have to be your way? Why is your way the right way versus all these other people? And I think mm -hmm. it, it kind of tends toward a more collaborative, more intellectually honest approach. And I wonder how much, uh, the medical, uh, community broadly speaking is kind of responding to similar sorts of information availability. Mm -hmm. It's definitely going to be so dependent on yeah. different areas of medicine because so many people, again, the lay person just doesn't have the knowledge to even come up with the right ideas of what to search when it comes to some of these interventions. Um, and I, I think that some of them too just have kind of a hard way of really drawing any real firm conclusions from what they're seeing with some of this. Because again, some people will see some of that back and forth and see like, oh, this person's saying it's a very good net positive. This person's saying it's a little bit more mixed. This one's saying it's a net negative. And if people won't be able to interpret the sure. statistical significance of certain Especially things. Especially when it comes to um, primary, primary research. That's tough. And, yeah. mm -hmm. and that's why I think it's very important for publications like Mass and examine.com and all of these resources that are out there like you know uh, mike soy i know you're a big fan of e3 rehab and, and the information that they put out because of how easy it is to digest from a mm -hmm. um, physical therapy perspective and injury management uh return to sport i think that it's really important to have these resources um barbell medicine does a fantastic job of this i think that it's it's a matter of like trying to take complex information and explain it simply and mm -hmm. something that's practical, you know, like yep. workload management being such a huge lever to pull in situations of injury for a power lifter. I mean, it's like the number one spot usually to start with, with most people. And it, it a lot of times gets the job done. Now, are there cases where other things have to be brought in other interventions? Probably, you know, and, and probably quite often, but most people, if they get an acute issue on a bench or a squat or a deadlift, some workload management being applied to, you know, their volume, their intensity. Yeah. I mean, you see that time and time again in your office hours, but like it's, mm -hmm. 
the other, so on one hand, we see a lot of technology helping to inform people and being available at their fingertips, but we also see a lot of misinformation and a lot of, a lot of that on social media. Hey, if you do mm-hmm. this test and you're lacking this amount of internal rotation in this segment of your body, therefore you're, you're going to be experiencing pain in this movement. And it's like, that's some really big logical jumps here. Like we're skipping a lot of research that hasn't happened yet. And we're ignoring some that has happened to make that, you know, uh, that inference there. So it's like, we also have the duty to help explain away some of that. Uh, which is why I yeah. think it's important you're doing what you're doing right now and being on this podcast to like talk about some of this stuff to like, we talked about interventions around warming up and interventions around like foam rolling and those sort of things. It's like, we also have to talk about some of the misinformation out there and some of the really big jumps in, in trying to expand the limitations in research that we have right now and how that could potentially no SIBO mm-hmm. people. Mm-hmm. Anything in particular come to mind on that topic? <laughs> All right. So the one I just saw, I just saw this one of like, if you're lacking internal rotation in your hip using a Faber test, then therefore you you could be, that could be the cause of your back pain. That could be the cause of your squat being this. And it's like, Mm. maybe, I mean, it's like, Hey, look, you got a diagnostic. I'm not saying that your diagnostic isn't important. I'm not saying that it isn't a good thing to develop tissue resiliency in a specific range of motion. Like that's good stuff. I can get behind that. But then to make the sure. next logical jump to say this could have caused your pain, yeah. you know, do you disagree? Totally. I mean, the proof is in the pudding. I mean, if you were to look at uh, prior to me starting jujitsu, I probably had a legitimate 10, 15 degrees of internal rotation on my hip um, throughout my powerlifting career. And in the case of, you know, again, does this impact me in the ability to get into my normal, comfortable squat stance and hit appropriate depth with my typical squat stance and if i'm checking those boxes like getting into positions comfortable getting the depth is comfortable it doesn't really matter um now someone's like oh i've actually been having this pinching in the front of the hip and i'm noticing that to avoid that pinch i'm starting to rotate a bit okay it might be worth developing so that internal rotation range of motion then but you know to say that somebody who lacks that rotation is set up for a disaster to happen down the road it's a big leap, uh, to say the least. You definitely see people outright. without that. And that's what I mean. It's like. Just seem to be fine and never never experience any sort of issue. Yeah. Yep. I mean, to, to take a different example, I mean, I think all of us have seen somebody who is perpetually lift, done a deadlift with like a excellent cat back. And we've seen them for years. Like, <laughs> Why hasn't he gotten hurt? When is it going to happen? And yet we have the people who are still out there saying, if you don't lift with a perfect neutral spine, you're going to get hurt. <laughs> Not that guy. So again, like you, we have anecdotal evidence right at our fingertips just to start to pick it apart. And then again, when we look at research, looking at again, injury risk factors, like this wouldn't pop up on it. It's just such a, but it is a nice narrative, right? That's kind of the allure of these overly biomechanical narratives is that it's like, oh, it's like putting a puzzle together. If I'm missing this, it leads to this, and now I've got this. But the reality of it is that our bodies don't work like that. We're not just a, a vehicle. We're constantly changing and adapting moment to moment. And to make these big leaps really just discounts the ability to body to adapt to I do wonder life. about some of this though that like there are certain um, injuries injury types uh, that we see uh, occur in in certain sports you know so it seems from from my mm. viewpoint uh, it looks like uh, low back injuries are common in powerlifting uh, although it would be tough to say that they're whether they're more or less common than population at large, but uh, something like knee mm-hmm. injuries among weightlifters or shoulder injuries among weightlifters, you know, it's more common to see shoulder injuries mm-hmm. uh, in baseball players than it is in soccer players, you know, to borrow an extreme example. So right. I do think there has mm-hmm. to be, well, to, to, I guess, maybe put a few more pieces in play. The, the techniques that we choose are going to place uh, 
strain more on some tissues versus other tissues, uh, partly because of the techniques that we choose, partly mm -hmm. just because hey, that's how you solve movement problems. Um, but and then there also must be some limit to the adaptability of those tissues that they're not infinitely adaptable. And if we're going to push it to the very limits of our adaptive ability, then those are likely the things that those are, those are your likely issues, you know? Right. That, that's, that's right. That, that's going to be the, the sure. weak link in the chain. So this, this is where we've now created that instantaneous adaptation of a, an acute injury under the bar. Or in some cases, this is my typical chronic pain spot that flares up when I start to really push the envelope as I'm prepping for a meet. Um, and it's just tough to say again, like how much of that is a factor of like, oh, I'm I'm missing sure. X degrees range of motion on this joint relative to the opposite joint on uh, you know that part of my body, and you know that's not likely the culprit. It's really just a matter of our exposure to these movements over time, our training history, and just um, you know what's the capacity of that given area in that moment. And it's going to vary moment to moment. Um, again, going back to the example of getting hurt sure. on a routine set or even a warm up. In, in theory, we've done hundreds of squats at a given threshold. We'd expect anything below that to be perfectly fine and able. But for whatever reason, every now and again, your body just says, well, it does make me wonder today. with something like the, the cat back deadlift uh, example that the, the chosen technique from, mm -hmm. from a mechanical standpoint must place greater forces on the the tissues in and around your back uh, so with that selected style is that kind of the likely the, the the i guess the tissues that are more likely to be injured i would expect probably but right because you have you have more you have the emphasis right. of the stress on and those just areas the, the, again those so. the limits of adaptive ability so like if you were really concerned about um wanting to to avoid injury it seems like it would make sense to try to distribute those loads among a variety of tissues to make the load management problem is really a, that becomes a, a very important probably main tool uh the the load management component mm -hmm. by distributing those forces out over a lot of different joints and tissues it seems like it would make the load management problem easier to solve correct and that's exactly what we look at technique as, you know, technique is in itself a form of load management. And that's why sometimes it's like, hey, like I'm having a lot of pec pain with my normal index finger on the ring grip. It's like, okay, well, why don't we bring in a little bit? Lo and behold, I shifted some stress to my anterior shoulder, my triceps, and pec doesn't bother me. Okay, yeah, we solved the problem of load management for the moment. And over time, we can start to shift some emphasis back to the pec as the pec yeah. feels ready to handle yeah, what you want to handle. Yeah. And ra rather than this, you know, trying to solve this complex equation of like having perfect range of motion at every joint textbook line by textbook line. Um, yeah, it's just really an issue of can, can my body do what I want it to do in the moment? And if it can't, how can I solve that problem? I heard on a data driven strength podcast, um, Josh and Zach were talking a little bit about some of the research around proximity to failure. And one of the things that they brought up as a point, as a potential hypothesis, is that stress can be distributed differently through with different lifters. And that in and of itself could be a potential explanation for why certain lifters respond to certain intensities rep ranges, frequencies, because of how much it stresses certain tissues. And, mm -hmm. you know, if you kind of think about that and you look at what Dr. Megan Jones has uncovered in her research and her work with lifters and her measurement around, you know, joint mechanics and things of that nature with different lifters, it sort of makes sense, right? Like, hey, you know what? In a squat, your knee extensors are maxing out and, and you start getting above 80% loads and here's what happens, right? Like we see this pattern, we see the knee shifting backward. Our logical explanation from a biomechanical model seems to be this, and that's backed up mm -hmm. with some EMG research. And that's about the best evidence that we have right now. Um, is it really substantial? That's arguable. 
but it is at least contributing to the story here. And if a mm-hmm. lifter seems to get hurt every time that they start touching 90% lows on their squat and it's their back that seems to be going, well, that contributes to a heuristic and a narrative. And there could be some interventions there, like limiting exposure to those intensities or limiting exposure to the lower back or, or more j- orthopedic friendly movements in the program that don't stress the back as much when combined with a load that's around 90% on squat, right? So it's like all of mm-hmm. these things can bring us to workload management again, uh, at workload management, exercise selection, and being really creative as a coach to try to work within this model in the absence of other evidence. Right. So go, going to that example with somebody having low back pain around 90% intensity on the squat, it's like, okay, I know that they're going to be going into this intensity range or prepping for a meet. Maybe I'll take out mental rose other program to limit the amount of extra low back stress that they have. You know, it's just choices as simple as that rather than trying to dive down the, oh, was he, you know, flexing and then extending under load with this 90% and chasing these different rabbit holes. Like, let's solve the obvious problem. Why don't we remove stress from the equation in contexts that don't directly contribute to the competition lift? and save the capacity for handling stress for those moments. Right. Like instead of like, Hey, we need to gain this many X, you know, degrees of, of, uh, internal rotation by doing all of these prehab exercises, rehab exercises prior to you squatting. It's like, well, we've seen this pattern happen before. It happens with these intensities. Here's what we see from a view of your squat from the side. And here's your training program. What would be the easiest solution that we could take to see if this intervention was successful? Right. Like it makes a lot of sense. I, I've honestly been thinking in my program recently, we've been doing a lot of like time limited rest break stuff, really pushing the high RPEs because of it. And I've been thinking to myself, you know, I've got some mileage on me and uh, I've had a number of injuries. It's like there's other orthopedic friendly movements that I could get this similar energy systems work on that would probably result in lower incidence of lower back pain. Why don't I just mm-hmm. do that? Like, if I want to work up to like a hard squat, why don't I just do that and then shift on over to something that's a little more joint friendly? Ooh, novel concept. It's like people have been doing this for a long time, but it's like, that's the kind of creativeness that research, th- this understanding of the biopsychosocial model of pain can help when it comes to programming. If we can mm-hmm. combine those and, and try to take a more simpler approach of like, hey, when we do these things, we get pain. Well, how do we modify things so that we don't get as much pain? probably can solve a lot of the problems that way. Yeah, I'd agree yeah. 100%. Possibly coming to an abrupt close here, but I kind of got wrapped up in conversation and kept you going longer than uh, longer than we intended to. So I appreciate you being uh, extra gracious with your time and, and always uh, appreciate uh, the, the knowledge and perspective that you bring to conversations like this. I always find your commentary to be really um, even, even in, in grounded with, uh, what, you know, real, uh, lifters and athletes see in, in the gym. So that's always something that we appreciate. I appreciate that. Yeah, well, oh, thank um, you, man. It means so just much. to, uh, I suppose, close all the loops. If there's anyone listening who would like to, uh, uh get in touch with you and maybe, uh, pick your brain further on any sort of issues that they might be having, what's the best way for them to do that? Uh, the best way would actually be to come to my office hour on the RTS training lab. That way, again, we could have just a video conversation or I can't get on video, just have a voice conversation to really get through some of the nuance of the topics to be discussed without having it lost in text or translation. Plus, I'm kind of <laughs> holding to that time slot, too, which is always good because I'm very, very easily distracted with the demands of my normal life to be like, Oh crap! As John could attest to with this email from August, I I just <laughs> I feel your pain to. on email, um, man. That's a, <laughs> so, a that's a tough medium. I'm definitely most easily reached on uh, the office hours, but uh, reaching out to me on social media at Soya Physical Therapy is always a a good way to get at me. Typically, the office hour is the best way, and then my awesome. business social media. Awesome. Is well, thank you second. again. Thanks for the conversation. Thanks, John, for being here. Thanks everybody for watching and listening, and we'll see you guys next time.